Macbeth, Shakespeare's classic. Now, the first thing I need to remind you of is what I said in the earlier lecture, the introduction to Shakespeare. Shakespeare assumed you would watch his plays, not read his plays. But then Shakespeare didn't write his plays for you. He wrote his plays for people living in roughly 1600. Got me? We today enjoy watching Shakespeare's plays, but when we want to study the play, we will take an approach that includes reading the play. We will call it annotating the play. As we read, we take some notes. We will be served with some professional actors who are performing the play on audio, not video. You're not going to watch it. You're going to listen. And while you listen, you're going to follow and read. The objective is that somewhere by the second act, you will grow more comfortable with reading alone the literature, the language. As we read, I will be making observations regarding the play Macbeth and the major themes. We will spend a lot of time at 2A to speak in terms of our annotative language, themes, messages. So right away we'll begin to do this project of kind of pointing out the ways in which Shakespeare is trying to again reach two audiences. What are they? Write them down before we say them. What are the two audiences of Shakespeare? He's writing for that audience that stands on the ground in front of the stage. We call them quite literally the groundlings, yes. They are there to hear spectacle, to see spectacle, to hear uh, you know, gutter language and comedy and that kind of thing. And they like good fights, they like blood and guts and all of that. And then there's that second audience we mentioned. Who was that second audience? Do you remember what we call them? They're the thinking audience. That's the philosophic audience. They're the audience that wants to try to learn something from these plays. Or we might say it this way. The thinking audience enjoys the questions of life asked and sometimes answered. We'll, we'll pick up with this when we hit these themes right away. Uh, and we'll do it pretty quickly right away. Now again, just to remind. We want to point out the ways in which Shakespeare is able to enjoin, please, both audiences, the thinking audience and the audience of the groundlings who enjoy spectacle and the light. He can do it simultaneously, and we'll see it right away in the very first act, very first scene. Now, let's get a few things out of the way in terms of logistics before we go to this work. One, Shakespeare writes plays in five acts. All of his plays are divided up into five acts. In Shakespeare's plays, he loves to let the audience know what some of the characters are thinking. Now in movies, you can do this easily by literally having the actor standing there, mouth's not moving, but you can hear his voice or her voice and you immediately know, oh, that's code language for that's what she's thinking. In Shakespeare, he does something a little bit different. He has the aside and the soliloquy. In both cases, the aside and the soliloquy are when a character speaks for the audience to hear. Nobody on stage is supposed to hear what the, is said in a soliloquy and an aside. Got me? The difference between the soliloquy and the aside is simple. The aside is spoken when other people are on stage. But they're going to pretend like they don't hear what is being said. The soliloquy is simple. No one else on stage. One person speaking out loud. So the only ones hearing, obviously the audience. We're going to see a number of these soliloquies as well. Not only in the play Macbeth, but also in the play Hamlet. All right? All right, with that in mind now, I think we've got enough introduction. First of all, let's get right out of the way. Let's get our setting. Where are we? Somewhere in Scotland. We are in a country named Scotland, that's true. Be more specific. 
Where are we? We are in the Badlands. See, I can use that term, and you know what that term means. We are in the middle of nowhere, the Badlands. What time of the day? What time of the day? It is the middle of the night. It is the middle of the night. Enter three witches. Now, the thing about witches and what they're supposed to look like, Shakespeare invents in many ways this idea that witches are these women who mix, you know, some kind of pot, mix some kind of uh, brew or spell, casting spells. And so we're going to see these three witches right away. Later, Banquil will say about these three women, I would call you women except for your beards. In other words, it's his way to say there's something wrong with you. You're not a normal woman, and they're not. These, w these witches are going to play an interesting role in our play. Here we go. Macbeth. One, one. Thunder, lightning, or in rain. When the hurly burl is done, when the battle's lost and won, that will be how the set of sun where the place upon the heat dare to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grimalkin. And it calls anon. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Through the fog oh, and fill this fear. Over through the fog. Fair is foul yeah. and foul is fair. Over through the fog and fill the air. Now it's interesting to me because uh, <laughs> even students who are completely convinced they hate Shakespeare and they don't want to watch a performance of Shakespeare especially a live performance, they cannot help but be somehow attracted to this. Even if they say it's stupid, it's still kind of freaky to watch this performance. Physically, iconically to watch it. When you have a good acting troupe, they can do some really wacky things with the way these women are going to look. Shakespeare, I told you, is kind of the first Steve Spielberg. So he's going to do all kinds of special effects. So he's going to bring these witches up through a trap door right into the, uh, in, onto the stage of the Globe Theater where he will have these three witches. And let's now pay attention to what it is that they say. The very first, notice, always in Shakespeare plays, Romeo, you don't see until later into the act, first act. Othello, you won't see until later into the first act. King Lear, you won't see until the second scene. You're not going to see Macbeth in scene one either. Instead, dude, I'm here to see a play called Macbeth, but the first thing I see are three witches who ask, their very first question is, when shall we three meet again? When are we going to get back together? They're already mixing a spell. When shall we get back together? Notice, when... The hurly-burly's done. Shakespeare will invent this word. He invented a lot of words. Hurly-burly means what? What's a hurly-burly? Yeah, the turmoil of the war, the fighting. When the hurly-burly's done, when the battles... Look at it closely. Now all of a sudden you become a scholar and a thinker as you're looking at this. When the battles lost and won. Let's point out right away, this is going to be a play of paradoxes. Now, what does that mean? What is a paradox? When two things don't what? Don't fit together very well, right? A paradox. Notice here, when the battles lost and won. What, is, what does that mean, but lost and won? Well, one side's going to win, which means what? The other side's going to lose, right? So they say, as soon as the battle's over, we're going to get back together. Look at the next one. That will be air set of sun. By the end of the day, in other words, the battle's going to be resolved. Where the place upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. And for the first time then, we get his name mentioned. We know this is going to be a play about a guy named Macbeth. And the witches are the ones that mention his name. 
and they say, we're going to meet with Macbeth. Now, let's just point out right away, that is not good news. You don't want to be met by witches, okay? Because witches usually are understood as something not so good, but kind of bad. Then they will finish with a couple of observations regarding uh, the putting together of spells and the like, as you can kind of see there in your side note. The notion of toads or frogs always seem to somehow be a part of which culture Shakespeare really, you know, kind of making this popular, popularizing this idea. And then finally, all of them start dancing around the fire and the cauldron, and they start chanting together, fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. So interestingly, look at what, look at what they chant. Good is bad, and bad is good. This is going to be a play where things that often appear good are actually bad, and things that often appear bad, foul, are actually good. What, I mean, what's, what, how are you supposed to feel if you're the audience watching these three witches, ugly, disgusting, scary witches, come out and dance around the fire? Scary. Middle of the night. It's scary, keep going. Startling, Startling uncertain. It can, shark, it can shock an audience. I, in fact, I watched, when you guys watched this, a good number of your colleagues watching this performance, and that was the first thing that came out onto the stage, and then I just kind of sat and watched the group, as I often will do when I watch high school students watch Shakespeare. And they went from, what is this about, to, whoa, whoa, whoa. That, this is kind of weird. This is kind of, really? You know? At, but right away... There's going to be a sense something's up. Now, if you're paying close attention to the language, let's go to one, two. If you're paying close attention to the language, you know that there's a hurly-burly. There's a war. Got me? Now, let me help you understand a little what's going on so it'll make more sense. We've got Scotland. It is run by a great king, for your notes, named Duncan. Duncan is a great king, but he's an old man. We're in the middle of a fight. Here's why. Duncan, the king of Scotland, has had a traitor who has betrayed him. And onto the stage will come a wounded soldier. His guts are coming out of his stomach because he's been wounded. Shakespeare will literally give this guy the appearance of his guts. He's literally holding his guts in his hand as he comes onto the stage. He is dying. But before he dies, or before he goes to the doctor... He must report to the king what happened. He will be told simply this. In the middle of the battle, the Scottish troops were about to lose when all of a sudden two mighty warriors stepped up. They fought back to back to protect each other. Their names, Macbeth and Banquo. Macbeth and Banquo were told. We're told that Macbeth, are you ready for this? Sorry if this grosses you out. We're told that Macbeth is such a great warrior that when he came face to face with the guy, the bad guy, he cut him with his sword from his groin to his gullet. He pulled out all of his insides. He took off his head and stuck it on top of a stick. That's what we're told Macbeth did. The response by Duncan is not the look on the face of a number of you like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, that's not M Duncan's response is, oh, worthy gentleman. That's what Duncan says about Macbeth. He calls him a gentleman. Now, right away, let's point out, Shakespeare's wanting us to know we're in a different time. We're in a time in Scottish history when you were a gentleman, not because you wore nice clothes and you had lots of money, you were a gentleman because you were a great and mighty warrior. The fighters were the best gentlemen. Got me? And Macbeth, we're told, is the greatest fighter. He can fight so well that he can completely destroy his enemy by cutting him from his belly button to his throat and pulling out all his entrails and taking off his head. Got me? We are then told Macbeth and, and Banquio are the reason Duncan has won the war. Act 1, scene 2. Let's now listen to that one. What bloody man is that? 
He can report as Seamith by his plight of the revolt, the newest state. This is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend. Say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave it. Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their heart. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel, thought of that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of Kearns and Galloglass it is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak, for brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel which smote with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. As whence the sun gins his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunders break, so from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Mark, King of Scotland, mark. No sooner justice had with valor armed compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed, not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo? Yes, a sparrow's eagles or the hare, the lion. If I say sooth, I must report they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. Except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha, I cannot tell. But I am faint. My gashes cry for help. <laughs> so well thy words become thee as thy wounds. They smack of honor both. Go get him, surgeons. Who comes here? The worthy Thane of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king! Which gives thou, worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal trait of a Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict, till that Bellona's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us. Great happiness! That now, Sweno, the Norway's king, craves composition. Nor would we deign him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Colm's Inch ten thousand dollars to our general use. No more that Thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go pronounce his present death. And with his former title, Greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. We got some politics involved here you gotta jot down in your notes. The King of Scotland, Duncan, old man, has to fight against Norway, his close enemy, because the Thane of Caldor, who is kind of second in command to Duncan, has betrayed him. He is, the first time the word is used in our play, a traitor. A traitor. Now, when we're talking about a traitor, we're talking about an individual that has sold out his country. Okay? He has, if you will, deceived the king, I suppose is a good way to say it. This is going to be a play about deception. This is going to be a play about deceiving. This is going to be a play about traitors. Right from the start, we're told of it. When you hear the word Thane, just think soldier. That's all it means. Caldor will be the kind of uh, title that he has, okay? By the way, notice for your notes, here, this information is provided by a second messenger named Ross. Every time Ross comes onto the stage to deliver information as a messenger, he's going to give important observations. This is true throughout the entire play. Ross will say, the Thane of Cowder, your second in command, King Duncan, has been caught. Duncan says, we're jacking him. We're jacking him. He's, he's getting jacked. 
But at the very end of 1-2, we're told something good happens out of something bad. Fair is foul and foul is fair. The Thane of Kaldor title, second in command to the throne, if you will, is now given to Macbeth. Where is Macbeth, though? Macbeth is on the battlefield still. Macbeth is on the battlefield still. He will be told here in a little bit, you have been awarded this major prize, Thane of Cowder, which is including title, but also some bank as well. In other words, just like in our, remember our poem Beowulf? I'm making a 3A observation here, aren't I? Remember our poem Beowulf, you're a great king if you're a ring bestower. That is to say, if you're gratuitous or you're, um, you know, you show gratitude by giving things to your warriors, all right? So Duncan is going to say to Macbeth, Way to go. Now I'm going to give you this, uh, this really good title, Thane of Kaldor. We haven't met Macbeth yet. We're through one and two. So now we're taking one three and we're joining it uh, uh, to one one. And now the three witches are there. They are going to go through a little kind of observation about where they've been and what they've been doing to show that they've been doing nasties, as witches will do. And then Macbeth will come onto the stage. Uh, we're going to listen to this, but I want you to put a note in your, in your annotations to this effect. Always interesting to look at the very first words spoken by the major actor of a Shakespeare play, major character. So, for example, if I were to ask you, I don't predict that you can do it, but if I were to ask you, what is the very first lines Romeo speaks? As seniors, if you were to go back and look at those very first lines of Romeo, and some of you will Google this just to see it, you will say, oh, whoa, there's all kinds of importance now that I know that play. There's all kinds of importance in the very first thing he says. That's true for the very first lines that Lear speaks, the very first lines that Othello speaks, the very first lines that Hamlet will speak, and that famous aside, a little more than kin and less than kind, and on and on we could go. So the very first words that Macbeth speaks, anyone want to scan to see what they are? What are the very first words that he speaks? How foul and fair a day I have not seen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's interesting about that? I mean, right away what's interesting about that? If you've been paying even kind of attention to this play, you know what? Who's the ones that have spoken those words? The witches. You got it. The witches. Which seems to suggest already they're casting their spell, putting their net out onto the waters to catch poor Macbeth. What does it mean to say so foul and fair a day I have not seen? By the way, when he comes on stage, he's covered in blood and guts. Why? Why is he covered in blood? He's coming back from the battle. He's got blood on his face. He's got blood on his hands. This is a play for your notes. This is a play of blood. We're going to see it over and over again, a play of blood. It is a play of butchery. It is a play of killing. It's a play of slaughter. And Macbeth has been slaughtering. Why, why foul? Do you have any sense of it? It's bad weather. Write it down. Bad weather. Now, in Shakespeare's day, no kidding, you got up in the morning, and if the weather looked bad, you literally went back inside your house a lot of times. I am not kidding. These people were hyper superstitious. They, they oftentimes equated bad weather with bad stuff about to happen. I ain't fooling you. And so, for example, if it was thunder and lightning outside, they often would not go outside of their house. They would stay indoors for the entire day out of fear something terrible was happening. Weather is in this play going to correlate with bad things happening, no, no doubt. So is night. Night is also going to be very often associated, and certainly in this play, we've already seen this, haven't we? One, one, we open the play in the middle of the night. The, 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 um, also, there's going to be a lot of fog in one three, which will, of course, immediately think, make us return to that hover through the fog and filthy air line of one one. Why is it a fair day? He won. Hurrah, I'm the winner. He's alive. Wait a minute. When he comes on stage, he ain't alone, though. He's with his best pal, Banquo. Now, Banquo will serve as his foil or his alter ego, as it's often referred to, as his other. Banquo is a significantly important person in the play, even though he doesn't get a lot of prime time in the play, for reasons I'm going to save and talk about later, all right, when we get to it. 
Banquo, for your notes now, is Macbeth's best friend. That's important because when Macbeth is hailed by the three witches, I'm setting you up and then we'll listen. He's hailed, first of all, as the title he currently has, Thane of Glamis. Then he is hailed, secondly, as the title he's about to be given, but he doesn't know this yet, Thane of Caldor. Then third, the witches will hail him as king hereafter. Whoa. That's good news, by the way. That's like, be, that's like uh, going to the uh, fair and, you know, that fortune teller lady, and she says, tomorrow you're going to win $10 million in a free lottery. They give away the money. But Macbeth, instead of going, yay, I get to be king someday, he does go, but he doesn't say anything. Look at what Banquio says immediately after the three witches hail Macbeth as king hereafter. What, 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 what does his pal Banquio say about him? Now, it's interesting because best friends know things. They pick up on things that other people wouldn't pick up on. Banquio points out, why do you start? Like, it's almost like somebody's read his mind and seem to fear things that are so fair, that are good, right? That is to say, why are you, why? and then Banquia wants to play the game, like he's at the fair and the fortune teller's there. Hey, 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 tell me, tell me what my future will be. Uh, Banquio will be given his famous three prophecies. This is a play, you can write it down, this is a play of threes. And these prophecies will come. First early, and then later, these three prophecies will come. Here, Banquio's going to get a, a three prophecies. And again, I want you to point out for your notes, and then you'll hear it. Paradox. Paradox. It's not going to make sense. For example, one of the three prophecies to Banquio is that you're not going to be as happy as Macbeth. You're just going to be happier. Yeah, and Chris just kind of went like this. What? Like that. And that's exactly how Banquio does it on stage. Like, what? Then all of a sudden, guess who comes on stage? Ross. What we say about Ross? He's the messenger, isn't he? He comes onto the stage and he goes, hey, hey, I got great news. Uh, Macbeth, you get to be Thane of Cowder. The king is named you Thane of Cowder. Pay attention to who speaks as soon as he has been named Thane of Cowder. Is it Macbeth or is it Banquio? Okay. And then right away, Macbeth starts to have strange things in his mind, strange thoughts in his mind. Of course, the easiest way for us to say it today is two down, one to go. Isn't that the way we say it? Wait a minute, what's the two down? Well, he's already Thane of Gloms and he's just been named Thane of Kaldor. What's left? Right? So all of a sudden, we're going to get the two down, one to go thought, which suggests something's up with Macbeth in his mind. He will step off to the side for a little bit and he'll kind of speak out loud so the audience can understand but nobody else on stage pretends like they can hear it. What do we call that again? Soliloquy. It's an aside, not a soliloquy. Remember, a soliloquy and an aside are similar but soliloquy is just one character alone. And Macbeth's not alone. He's got other people on stage with him but it's definitely an aside where we're going to hear Macbeth's been thinking about wanting to be king. There's only one problem. You don't vote kings in from Monty Python, right? I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for a king. See, that's the, that's the joke uh, of Monty Python's Holy Grail. You don't vote for kings. How do you become a king? You have to be what? You have to be the son of a king, don't you? Right? You have to be the son of a king. Well, Duncan already has two sons. Malcolm and Donald Bain, we've already met one, haven't we? In one, two, right? That is to say, Macbeth can only be king by doing nasties. That's the only way he's going to get to be king. All right, let's listen now to one, three. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife. Her chestnuts in her lap and mounched and mounched and mounched. Give me, quoth I, a roint thee, witch, the rampant Ronion cries. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, mass 
master of the tiger. <laughs> but in a sieve, I live in a sail, unlike a rat without a tail. I'll do, <laughs> I'll do, and I'll do. I'll give thee a without kind, and I and I myself have all the others. And the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know with a shipman's card. <gasps> I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. <sighs> he shall live a man forbid. Weary seven nights, nine times nine, shall he dwindle, peak. Can pine, though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest tossed. Look what I have. Show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb, cracked as homeward he did come. A drum, a drum, and death doth come. The weird sisters hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus to go about, about, thrice to thine, and thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is go to Faris? that man may question. Shh. You seem to understand me. By each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women. Yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak, if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glam. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to the Thane of Cordor. All hail, Macbeth, that shalt be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start? You seem to fear things that do sound so fair. In the name of truth, are ye fantastical, or that indeed which outwardly ye show? My noble partner, you breathe with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope. But he seems wrapped with all. To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Hail. 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 Lesser than Macbeth. And greater. Not so happy yet. Much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth. All hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. By sight of death, I know I'm Thane of Glamis. By the howl of Cordor. The Thane of Cordor lives, a prosperous gentleman. And to be king stands not within the prospect of belief no more than to be Cordor. Save from whence you owe this strange intelligence. Or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting? Speak! I charge you! <sighs> the earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air. What seemed purple melted as the breath of the wind. Would they had stayed? Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be king. And Thane of Cordor too, went it not so? To the self-same tune and words. Who's here? The king hath happily received, Macbeth, the news of thy success. And when he reads thy personal venture in the rebels' fight, his wonders and his praises do contend which should be thine or his. Silenced with that, in viewing all the rest of the self-same day, he finds thee in the stout Norwayan ranks nothing afeard of what thyself didst make strange images of death. 
as thick as hail, came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defence, and poured them down before him. We are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. And for an earnest of a greater honour, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor, in which addition, hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What? Can the devil speak true? The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both he laboured in his country's rack, I know not. But treason's capital confessed and proved have overthrown him. Alarms and fain of Cordor. The greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings? When those that gave the thane of Cordor to me promise no less to them? That trusted help might yet enkindle you one to the crown, besides the thane of Cordor. This train. And oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word I pray you. Two truths are told, as happy prologues to the swelling act of the Imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill cannot be good. If ill, why has it given me earnest of success convincing the truth? I am fain of Cordor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes all my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is but what is not. Look how our partner's wrapped. If chance will have me king, why, chance may crown me without my stir. New honors come upon him like our strange garments, cleave not to their mold, but with the aid of use. Come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Give me your favor. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered, but every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. Think upon what hath chanced. And at more time, the interim having waited, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very gladly. Till then, shh, enough. Come, friends! One of the really interesting <clears throat> things to always point out in the study of Shakespeare is the way in which he will blend or weave ideas, themes, so one of the things I want to point out is the way in which in this play there are certain kinds of, I'm going to use a word now, motifs or themes. One of the most popular that has often been referenced in the study of the play Macbeth is what we will call the garment theme. The garment theme. All the way through this play, clothes matter. The way you're garbed, the way you're dressed, your garment. And in this very scene, we will in fact right away be introduced to this. Notice that when Macbeth is named Thane of Cawdor by who? Ross. The messenger character Ross. The first thing he says is, why do you address me in borrowed robes? Then a little bit later, Banquiel will point out, look how our partner is wrapped. It's as if he's taken his garment and wrapped it around him. We will point out this theme all the way through this play, the notion of you are what you wear or your garments. Sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't fit. Notice, though, Banquio's three prophecies. The first which will prophesy that Banquio will be, again, 347 
Line 65. Lesser than Macbeth, but greater. You're not going to be as great as Macbeth. You're just going to be greater than Macbeth. What? See, paradox. Look at the next one. Not so happy. This is the one we mentioned before. Yet must ha much happier. And then finally, look at this one. Thou shalt get kings. What does that mean? Your sons will be kings, though thou be not. Right. You're never going to be a king, but your sons will get to be king. Which is, of course, very problematic because, as we've already pointed out, your daddy has to be a king if you're a son and you want to be a king. And yet there the prophecies are. Notice that it will now um, fall on uh, Banquio to make the observation to Macbeth, we got to be careful what we think about these witches. Notice that Banquio will point out that uh, this, is, this is kind of dangerous. Look on page 348. Macbeth will say, your children shall be kings. He's playing the game already of the prophecies. Look at Banquio. You shall be king, right? Notice Macbeth says, and Thane of Cowder too, were it not so. To the self-same tune and words, who's there? Ross comes on and he says, hey, you're Thane of Cowder. It will be Macbeth who remains silent. It will be Banquio who says, what? Can the devil speak true? What does that mean, the devil? The witches, you got it. They're known to be evil, foul, and yet they've given a good message, fair, it's true, right? He that, uh, uh, the thing of Cowder lives, Macbeth says, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Well, Angus will say, yeah, he lives, but not for long. We're going we're gonna to jack him good. The very first aside, top of page 349, Glams and Thane of Cardor, the greatest is behind, which tells the audience what? Two down, one to go. Let's point this out right away. Macbeth is the protagonist hero of our play. He's not very, not very heroic, though. But... To follow the way Aristotle thought about great drama, he will begin a high and noble man, a great and mighty warrior, but by the end of the play, some of Shakespeare's groundlings are tossing eggs at him as he is coming onto the stage. He is so loathed. He's one of the worst of Shakespeare's villains. He begins high and he ends low. He ends pretty ruined and in a wretched state. Notice it will be Banquio that will give the caution at line 121, you better be careful because sometimes he says, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, line 125, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. In other words, what does that mean? Sometimes witches will tell you the truth just so they can get you even worse later. Macbeth's next aside will tell us just how dark his thoughts are. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme, imperial ear, royal, kingly. And then he'll say, I thank you, gentlemen, for your news. And then he comes back to it. Look at how confused he is. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Right? He's not sure. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Take a look at it. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, bad, cannot be good. Which is it? Is it good news or bad news? If ill, that is bad. Why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? Can't be totally bad. I mean, look, it was true. I am Thane of Caldor. If good, in other words, if it's a good thing, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? He asks, if it's a good thing, why am I thinking such terrible thoughts right now that would make my hair stand up? He says, I'm thinking such horrific things. What do you imagine he's thinking about? Yeah, how he's going to jack the king, right? To get to the throne. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, and then he uses the word for the very first time, whose murder yet is but fantastical. He's only thought about murdering. Shakes so my single state of man, the function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is but what is not in line. I'm confused. 
I don't know whether to be happy or sad about the way I feel right now about this dynamic. He's used the word murder already and important for a second theme of our play. Along with the garment theme, there is the theme of manhood. The question is simple. What constitutes a good man? And in this play, we're going to meet that question over and over again. Pancreas will say, look, our partner's wrapped. That is to say, he's kind of distracted. Look, look at what Macbeth says next in another aside. If chance shall have me king, why chance may count me? Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. If I'm going to be king, I guess I'll get to be king. If I'm not going to be king, I guess that's just the way it works out. How long do you think he'll have that que sera, sera view? Well, not long, right, not long. So he's going to have this tension, let's say it this way for your notes. There's like this psychological tension. Here already we're watching, we're watching a man's mind begin to be broken down so that he'll hear a promise, you'll get to be a king. Then he gets the prophecy fulfilled of Thane of Kaldor. Then he begins to already start to think about, what do I got to do to become king? What do I got to do to... Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to let chance crown me king if chance will have me king. Yeah, we kind of get the idea. That, I, that attitude isn't going to last for long. We will finish 1-3 by Macbeth saying at the very bottom of 349, and by the way, this is why we read and don't just watch this play. Look at what he says. Give me your favor. My dull brain, that's because he's called back. He's been standing off to the side. And they've been talking for a few seconds. And Macbeth is kind of like almost lost in thought. It's almost like he doesn't even realize those guys are there. Look what he says. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. What does that tell you? I forgot about he forgot about what? He forgot about oh, wanting to be king. Right. It's fairly clear that this is a play, first and foremost, about power, about ambition. Uh, there was an old-time preacher I heard once as a kid. He had a famous sermon, and it went like this. He got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. He got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. Mr. Nelson, the story of David and Bathsheba, a very popular story from the Old Testament, was his proof text here. But it works perfectly for Macbeth. He gets what he wants, power, because he has ambition. But he loses what he had, namely respect, honor. And he says here, I've been thinking about this thing about wanting to be a king, and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. The witches remind him. Put it in your notes. We will come to this question over and over again, and that's why I'm raising it now in 1-3. Who is to blame for all of the terrible things that happen in this play? Let's say it out loud, Mr. Durad. Macbeth becomes a pathological killer. This is a play about a mass murderer, a pathological murderer, <clears throat> an individual who murders and doesn't even think twice about it. Okay? The question will obviously be, who is to blame for this? Who do you blame for this kind of thing? And, of course, the answers are going to be mixed. One obvious answer already is Macbeth has clearly already been thinking about it. He says as much. I had forgotten that I had been musing about what it would mean to be a king. Of course, we could also already blame the witches, right, who we've met. Ultimately, we may meet one or two other characters as well who will come to play important influence. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. And then an aside to Banquio. Think upon what hath... Look at the word he uses. Chanced. Oh, what a lucky chance. The whole notion of luck. And at more time, the interim having weighed, let us speak our free hearts to each other. Macbeth says, I'm very interested in what you have to think about what has just transpired. Leaving the audience to understand that Macbeth is already thinking about what it would take to get the throne, to become the king. And of course, we're going to watch a man who will pursue that ambition for power with nasty, nasty actions. Okay, and, and yet, we're going to walk away from it for a few moments as we get ready to begin uh, scene four.
one four. I want to set you up to it. The old thing of Kaldor is a traitor. He must be executed. We are in Anglo-Saxon times, and if you break this terrible, egregious violation of, of the rule, you are a traitor to your country and your king. You are executed. However, Duncan will ask about this thing of Kaldor. How did he how did he die? And he will be told by his son, Malcolm, you know what? He died pretty well, actually. He died pretty well. He died with honor. So even though he was a traitor, he died with honor. Then Duncan says what will become for us memorizable lines. Because we're going to look at these lines over and over again on page 350. Duncan will say at line 12, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Go back and look at it again, Mr. Durant. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Duncan will say about the Thane of Cowder, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. And then he finishes by saying he was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. The old Thane of Cowder, he says, he completely trusted this is the, in, the injection of a major theme of our play. It is the theme of deception, right? Of hypocrisy, of always appearing to be something than what you are. Shakespeare loves this theme. We see it in many of his plays. The Duncan King will say, I had no clue. Dude, I totally trusted this guy. Then onto the stage will come everyone. Malcolm is there, his son, as well as Macbeth. And Duncan will name his son Malcolm next in line to the throne. Now that's not a huge shock because Malcolm is his son and Duncan is old. But immediately we want to pay attention now to what Macbeth says when he hears that Malcolm is named next in line to the throne. What's wrong with Malcolm being na named next in line to the throne? What's wrong with that for Macbeth? That means he doesn't get to be king, Malcolm gets to be king, which obviously poses a serious problem. Even if he were to kill Duncan, what? He still has the issue of Malcolm, his son. Guess what? Duncan has another son as well. His name is Donald Bain. Okay, so both Donald Bain and Malcolm stand in the way for Macbeth to make it to the throne. Let's take a look at this quick scene. Just listen to it. Is execution done on Cawdor? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as twere a careless trifle. <sighs> There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Oh, worthiest cousin! The sin of my ingratitude even now is heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness' part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Oh, welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, that hast no less deserved, nor must be known no less to have done so, let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. Uh, there if I grow, the harvest is your own. <laughs> my plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, thanes, 
and you whose places are the nearest know we will establish our estate upon our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. From hence to Inverness, and bind us further to you. The rest is labor which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger, and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So, humbly, take my leave. My worthy Godor. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down, or else o'er leap, for in my way it lies. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand. Yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. True, worthy Banquo, he is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. Brutal. Totally brutal. Shakespeare will play wicked games with his audience. The king will say... There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. There's no way to tell from somebody's face what he or she is really thinking, really going to do. He's talking, Duncan, is talking about the old Thane of Cowdor, his past pal who he totally trusted. Then look who walks onto the stage, Macbeth, and he says, Duncan says to Macbeth, you're the most amazing warrior guy, which of course we know is true. Remember, he stood out there in the middle of the battlefield, he risked his life and he killed all these bad guys, correct? He says to Macbeth, you're the most amazing guy, I totally trust you. To which Macbeth says, hey, thanks pal, anything for you, I would do anything for you. Duncan then turns around and says, I name my oldest son, Malcolm, next in line to the throne. And then in the aside, Macbeth will say, remember, an aside, he's speaking to the audience to tell the audience what he really feels. I'm on page 352, roughly line 48. Macbeth will say, the Prince of Cumberland, that is, of course, Malcolm, the son of Duncan. The Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. What does he say? What does he say? What happened to, hey, K Sarah Sarah, if chance shall have me king, then chance so crown me. That's what he said in the last scene. Now all of a sudden he's like, what? Hmm, Malcolm gets named in front of me? Somebody's gotta get jacked. Whoa, look at what he says next. Let not light see my black and deep desires. Why black? Yeah, he's thinking about ways he's going to have to not just kill Duncan, but what? He's going to have to figure out a way to jump to, to Jack as well. The sons of Duncan. Brutal. The eye wink at the hand. Yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. He says, I don't even want to think about how bad I'm going to be. I don't want to think about it because if I do, it could really trouble me. Macbeth has been speaking these lines a little bit to the side of the stage as an aside. Duncan and Banquio have been talking. The audience can tell they're talking back and forth. Then Duncan, brutal irony. Let's put it in your notes. This is an example of what we call dramatic or on-stage irony, right? Brutal irony. Look what Duncan says, the last lines of the scene. True, worthy Banquio, he is full, so valiant. He who? He who is so valiant. He's talking about Macbeth. Yes, he's talking about the very guy who has just said in an aside, I'm going to have to kill the old man. And the old man says about Macbeth, Whoa, he is a man above all men, full of valiance, courage, and in his commendation I am fed. Boy, this guy is my true next in line. He is a great fighter, and I can totally trust him. Brutal. The audience is sitting there going, 
You want to scream it out loud. You stupid old man. You made the mistake the last time with Athena of Cowder by being a little bit too easily fooled. And now you're doing it again. Only the problem is that the audience understands why Duncan would trust this guy. He stood in the middle of the battlefield, we're told, and he fought risking his own life. There's no reason to believe that Macbeth would be anything other than honorable, dependable, valiant. Notice, let's after him, whose care is gone before to aid us welcome. And then he says it one more time about him. This is just dark irony. It is a peerless kinsman. In other words, there's nothing wrong with Macbeth. You can't find any weakness in the man's character. Oh, brutal. One five. We will now be introduced to one of the more remarkable characters of Shakespeare's entire pantheon. A woman will come on stage. This woman needs to be as an actress when the play is performed today. She needs to be not only beautiful, but she's got to come across as really a strong woman. She usually comes on wearing black. She usually will have her hair up, pulled away from her face to show the power of her face. And as she comes on, she is reading a letter. The letter is from her guy. Yeah, from her guy. This is Macbeth's girl. She'll be called Lady Macbeth, or Macbeth's wife, throughout the entire play. She's reading a, a letter from Macbeth where Macbeth tells about the three witches and the prophecies of the three witches. And he, she finishes, and she says at line 12... Gloms thou art, and Caldor, he's just been named Thane of Caldor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Uh-oh, who's to blame for the psychopathic killer that Macbeth becomes? You can blame it on three witches. You can blame it on the prophecy of the three witches. You can blame it on Macbeth himself. You could blame it on Banquo, who knows kind of a little of what's going on. It doesn't say anything, and then, of course, it's too late. Or, dude, you can just blame it on the very woman that we're watching right now on stage who says, look what she says, and you will be what you are promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. What has she just said? This is one of those interesting word pictures you got to understand what she just said. What is it that she's just said about her man? She says, he got promised to be king. He will be king. And yet I fear he is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. What has she just said? He's a wimp. Yeah, he's a wimp. Now, wait a minute. We've just been told about this cat. This is the guy who was standing in the middle of the battlefield fighting 250 bad guys, and he got the one bad guy, and he cut him from his groin to his gullet, told, pulled out all of his entrails, took off his head, and stuck it on a post. That's the guy she's talking about, and she says, I'm afraid he's too much of a wimp. To do what he has to do. Catch the nearest way means what? Right, Jack the King. The only way you could become king is to kill the king, right? So... I'm afraid, though, he's a little too much of a nice guy. Then onto the stage comes a servant who says, King Duncan's coming to our house tonight. And she's like, no way. What's in her mind, do you imagine? <laughs> right, we're going to turn our house into the Holiday Inn. Or maybe more better for the old Eagle song, the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can't never leave. That is to say, he's coming, but he ain't going. Lady Macbeth is the one who then will step to the front of the stage and will say, we're going to do this thing. We will jack this old man so that my man can become king. And, of course, by extension, what? Yeah, if he gets to be king, she gets to be queen, right? Then onto the stage will come Macbeth. And you can tell the, the relationship between the two is pretty close. They'll hug, they'll kiss, etc. They're close. And then they get down to this conversation of Duncan. She asks, when, when does he leave? And... Macbeth will say, ah, oh, tomorrow. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see, is what she says. Brutal. In other words, we're going to take care of Duncan at the Holiday Inn tonight. Brutal. To which Macbeth will say, you know, I don't know about this. And then she will say something quite fascinating. She says, 
My, my, your, my Lord, your face is as a book where men may read strange matters. Yeah, you're showing too much. You're giving away too much here. Come on, boy. Wake up. If you're going to be a criminal, you got to be better at this than this. You're, you're giving up too much. Then she uses one of the most brutal word pictures in all of Shakespeare's plays. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. You got into the garden. You see this beautiful flower. You reach down to pick the flower, and from the underside, hidden, is a king cobra. Wham! You're dead. That's the word picture she uses for her guy. The lines in 1-5 join with the lines in 1-4. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. In other words, you're going to have to be a better actor. Note the irony. The actress playing Lady Macbeth will say to the actor playing Macbeth, you need to be a better actor. Or Duncan's going to figure out that there's something wrong. He will be suspicious. We got to take care of this old man tonight. Brutal. Let's listen to it. Follow along with the lines. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned from the perfectest report that they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. While I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king who all hailed me, Thane of Cordor, by the which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail, King that shalt be. That is if I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Glams thou art, and Cordor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily, <laughs> wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou wouldst have great glams, that which cries, thus thou must do if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do than wishes should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him who words so would have informed for preparation? So please you, it is true, our Thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who almost dead for breath had scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan. Under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here. And fill me from the crown to the toe. Top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, 
You murdering ministers. Whatever in your sightless substance is, you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Great glams, worthy corridor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Brutal. Brutal. So basically, basically, let's uh, let's put in our notes what we want to say about Lady Macbeth real quickly, okay? What do we need to say about Lady Macbeth? Well, first of all, let's point out that this is a this is a uh, a, a representative in many ways of Shakespeare's strong woman. All right, we'll see several of these women in Shakespeare's canon. For example, we can, we'll see in King Lear. We'll see uh, Regan and Goneril, some very similar kind of characters. What do we want to say about Lady Macbeth? Well, first of all, first of all, I, we got to be careful here by saying she's crazy, though, because uh, let's point out, she, let's point out, she's fully conscious of what she's doing, right? She understands that she wants the same thing her husband wants. The only difference is, what does she say about her guy? He doesn't have the guts to do it. He doesn't have the guts to do what needs to be done. Therefore, she says, no worries, I'll take care of everything. This is one of those things where I'll take care of everything. She's strong, strong, she's determined. Let's point out as well, Lady Macbeth is pretty smart. She understands she's going to have to do a sell job on her husband to get him to do what she thinks he really wants to do. Did you notice that? She says, you want to be king. We know that's true already. You just don't got the guts to do what it takes. Then she will come to the front of the stage. You ready for this? That line unsex me here. She prays to the devils. She immediately becomes the fourth witch, huh? She prays to the devils, to the powers of evil, to no longer turn her into a woman, but make her a man. To give her the strength to do what she has to do. Notice the final line of this scene. Leave everything to me. Duncan will be provided for. Of course, normally if you're at the Holiday Inn, to say we're going to take care of you means we're going to make sure you got a good pillow and an extra, extra blanket. When Lady Macbeth says we're going to take care of you, right? right? Bad news. Shakespeare is often in his plays teaching his male viewers a simple message. Beware of women. This is a clear message in this play. You got to watch out for women because they have a way of talking men into doing things men normally wouldn't want to do. Now as we get into this play a little bit more, we're going to watch this 
and we're going to see some interesting things about Lady Macbeth. Final comment about Lady Macbeth. She and Macbeth start out in opposite places when we meet them for the first time. Macbeth is this unbelievably honorable warrior type. Lady Macbeth is this pretty disgusting lowlife scumbag. By the end of the play, they will have switched positions. Macbeth, by the end of the play, is going to become a psychopathic killer. And Lady Macbeth will become a woman who has clearly seen, uh-oh, it's the uh-oh moment. Uh-oh, things, oh, this was done badly. I shouldn't have, right? And she will switch. By the end of the play, the audience will have some pity for Lady Macbeth. They will have no pity for the psychopathic killer who becomes Macbeth. Of course, Mr. Keeley's point is well made, I think, from yesterday. Macbeth's fall has, shall we say it, something to do clearly with Lady Macbeth. And Duncan is about to arrive. Notice at scene six, Duncan will be outside of Macbeth's castle. Brutal irony, he will say. Man, this is a great holiday inn. This looks like the best place to spend the night of all time. There's beautiful little birds that have built nests up in the uh, castle walls. This is the perfect place to spend the night. Uh, dark, dark irony. This is, of course, as we said, the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can't never leave. Uh, you, you're, not, you're not going anywhere from this hotel, right? Um, we should point out that there is an introduction of a theme here that we're going to see for the rest of the play recapitulated over and over again. Write it in your notes. It is the flight theme, or often referred to as the bird theme. We're going to see this over and over in this play. Every time there's a mention of birds, we're going to sit up and take notice starting in this scene. The introduction of the bird theme will come very early in 1-6. One, in one uh, then on, on to the stage will come Lady... Uh, uh, Macbeth. Now, some of you, when I point this out, are going to say, no, Shakespeare couldn't have meant to do this. Onto the stage comes Duncan. Onto the stage comes Banquio. Onto the stage comes Lady Macbeth. Look at what she says to him when he says to her, I'm so glad that you're going to take care of me tonight. Look what she says. All our service in every point twice done and then done double were poor and single business to contend against those honors deep and broad where with your majesty loads our house put it in put it in normal english what she just said can you put it in one line what she say to duncan i'm really glad you're here i'm really glad that i get to take care of you and you're here did you see the word point now for those of us who know this play how exactly does she jack the old man? With how many knives? Double points. Keep reading the line. Again, some of you are going to say, oh, did he do this on purpose or what? Look what she says. Oh, we're going to, set, we're going to take care of you not only with one point, but with two. And double that. Brutal. If you know this play, which is why you go back to watch it after you know it, if you know this play, you got to pick up some of the humor, the irony. By the way, when this play was performed last fall and you sat in the theater, I don't know if you recalled at all, if you could have recalled, that I was there and I laughed at this line. I always laugh at this line. It's darkly ironic, and there's a lot of them like this, where Shakespeare's almost seeming to kind of have a dark fun with this play, like, ha-ha, somebody's about to get seriously jacked with two knives, let's throw in a line where she says, I'm going to take care of you, not with one point, but with two. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, he says, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's just, yeah, right. It's kind of darkly ironic. Uh, scene, scene seven. I'm going to let you listen to both of these. That's why I'm kind of setting you up here. Scene seven begins with Macbeth's first soliloquy. Now, again, what is a soliloquy? One character, remember soul, S-O-L. What is it when more than one character on stage? The aside, excellent, the aside. The soliloquy, no one else on stage except for Macbeth. And he comes out onto the stage and look at the very first thing he says. If it were done when tis done, twere well it were done quickly. Put it in your own words. What's that mean? Right, if we're going to do this thing, we're going to jack this old man. Let's get it done 
fast. Why do you think he says that? He just wants to get done over Right. He doesn't want, it's that whole thing of, all right, all right, all right. We got to do this. We got to do this. So let's just get this old man done. Let's do it. In other words, I got to do this quickly or I'm going to start Thinking. I'm going to start thinking about it, and if I think about it, I might not do it. And then guess what he does? He starts thinking about it, and then guess what happens? He decides, yeah, we're not going to do this. On the stage comes Lady Macbeth, and he says to Lady Macbeth, yeah, we're not going to do this. I mean, come on, this is a bad idea in every way. First of all, I'm related to the cat in distant relations. Second of all, he's given me an award, the Thane of Cowder. Third... Dude, he's in my house. I'm supposed to protect the people who come in my house. Not to mention the fact he's the king of Scotland. You're not supposed to jack the king. Lady Macbeth will then give one of the most remarkable arguments. I want you to point out she never actually uses the word man or coward. She'll say, oh, I... I thought you loved me. Oh, that's what. You said that's what. You said you were going to do something for me. And now you're saying you're not going to do something for me. I thought I thought you loved me. And then of course, come on, let's say it out loud. Every guy who watches this play has to come face to face with this reality in the history of the world. More than once. A guy has done something really, I'll say it again, really stupid because some person, often a female, asked him very politely, are you, are you, are you afraid? Oh, you must be afraid. And all of a sudden, there's some idiot sitting behind a truck driving 70 miles across the Badlands with his lights off because somebody said, you're not, you, you don't, you, you can't do that, you're afraid to do it. Dude, I'm not afraid. I'll do. Lady Macbeth <laughs> understands male psychology. If you want to get a guy to do something he doesn't want to do, make fun of him. Make fun of him as being afraid. Now, it's really funny. Hello? Shakespeare's teaching us something. This is the beautiful propedeutic of this play. When you sit and watch what Lady Macbeth does to Macbeth, and by the way, let's point out for your notes, it works. It works. At 1-7, Lady Macbeth will say, Oh, I thought you, oh, I thought, I thought you had a set. By the way, that's exactly how she kind of phrases it. I thought you had a set. And he says, Hey, I'm a man. And she went, No, 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 no. You were a man when you said you were going to do it. Now, you're nothing. You're not a man. She says one more thing to him. If I had promised you something and broken my promise, I would have taken the baby that I was breastfeeding. I would have held it by its little ankles, swung it around, and bashed its brains out on a rock. That's what she'll say. That's, uh, now, some of you are giving me a look like, dude, that's like way over the line. To which I will say, no, no, this is what Macbeth says when she says that. When she says, I would have swung my infants and bashed his brains out on a rock if I had broken my promise to you, Macbeth will say, bring forth men children only. I hope all our boys end up just like you. That's what he says to Lady Macbeth. I hope all of our male children end up just like you. He's trying dark, to get points right there. Right? Dark, yeah. dark. <laughs> they, will end, they will end the act deciding... Okay, let's do this thing. We're going to kill this guy. The thing that's beautiful about this, though, follow this and then I'll hit play, is that once you watch how peer pressure really works, you have an insight. So I can remember years ago, I lectured this scene. And a couple of days later, one of my students came in and said, the funniest thing happened to me the other night. Uh, I was with my friends. And they were bugging me about trying to get me to do something that, quite frankly, I knew I shouldn't do, and it was probably against the rules, illegal, etc. And all of a sudden, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And all of a sudden, they started using Lady Macbeth's arguments. It was hilarious. It was like they didn't know Macbeth. They didn't know the play. But they started using that kind of peer pressure. Oh, what are you, chicken? What are you? And all of a sudden, I started smiling. They were like, what are you smiling about? And I said to them, yeah, the Lady Macbeth argument isn't going to work tonight. And I walked away. And I heard them behind my back going, 
the heck did he just say? The what argument? The le- something about Macbeth, Lady Macbeth or something. He said, the minute they started using it on me, I immediately was reminded of the way Lady Macbeth makes Macbeth look like a complete and total fool by leading him, like leading him by asking the right kinds of questions to jack with his, his ego, his mind, right? And it worked. It totally works. And from this point on, Macbeth starts to fall pretty quickly. Lady Macbeth is often then provided as the primary reason for some of the terrible actions of the play. But let's point out something. It only works because Macbeth allows it to work. It only works because Macbeth allows it to work. At any given point, Macbeth could turn to her and say, a real man doesn't take the life of a king. That's not what real men do. Right? He could have. He didn't. Got me? That is to say, in the end, he chooses to go ahead and allow her influence to affect him. Why? Because deep down inside, she knows him. He really does want to be king. He really wants the power. Even though it's going to ruin him, he'll go for the power. All right, here we go. Let's watch poor Duncan in the final words that he will speak later in Act 2. Of course, he's going to get bugged, right? Sorry about that. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. Ah, this guest of summer, the temple-haunting Martley, does approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No jutty frieze buttress nor coin of vantage, but this bird has made his pendant bed and procrean cradle. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed the air is delicate. See, see, our honoured hostess. The love that follows us sometime is our trouble, which still we thank as love. Herein I teach you how you should bid God yield us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service, in every point twice done and then done double, where poor and single business to contend against those honours deep and broad, wherewith your majesty loads our house. For those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. Where's the fane of Cawdor? We cost him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he rides well, and his great love sharp as his spur hath helped him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guest tonight. Your servants ever have theirs, themselves, and what is theirs in compt? To make their audit at your highness' pleasure, still to return your own. Give me your hand, conduct me to mine host. We love him highly, and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. If it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here, but here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips, He's here in double trust. First, as I'm his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, 
or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye the tear shall drown the wind I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent but only vaulting ambition which all leaps itself and falls on the other how now what news he hath almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, you're not. He has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteems the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat of the adage? Prithee, peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you'd be so much more than man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now doth unmake you. I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail. We fail? But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his hard day's journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I, with wine and wassail, so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleep their drenched natures lie as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put about his spongy officers, who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have done it? Who dares receive it other, as we shall make our griefs and clamours roar upon his death? I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away, and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. False face must hide what false heart must show. In other words, Macbeth's the one that says it this time. I can't let Duncan know what's going on in my heart, in my thoughts, by my face. What are the two sets of lines that already come to mind at 3A? Do you remember them? First of all, one set spoken by Duncan. He said what? There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. What scene? Do you remember? Scene two. Scene two. Scene one, fair is foul and foul is fair. Scene two, Duncan is told about Macbeth's great victory. Scene three, we meet Macbeth and the prophecies are given to him as well as to Duncan. Scene four. four. Duncan is told about the killing of the, the execution of the Thane of Cowdor, and he says, I totally trusted the cat. He was a man in whom I put complete trust. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. You cannot tell what people are thinking by looking at their face. How many freshmen in college go to the party and then, no, no, come on, this is the way, this is what we're supposed to do. No, this will be great, come on, come on. Right? And the student will go and then later will report to the officer or whatever. I, I thought, well, he, he was hot. He was like really good looking. And so I just, I just, I thought it was going to be fun. And so I, 
There is no art to find the mind's construction in effect. You don't know what people are really like by the way they look. Well, he looks really honest. Really. <laughs> See how that works? That's <laughs> Shakespeare. Really. Okay? There's a second line. It's spoken by Lady Macbeth, and she said what? Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. It's a powerful word picture, and it's going to come back because snakes kill with how many fangs? Two points, right? And now here we are at the end of Act 1, and Macbeth will say it himself, false face must hide what's in the heart, false heart, right? Now let's... Let's talk real quickly about how Lady Macbeth convinces her man this is, a good, this is what we got to do. Did you notice that? Go back and take a look at it again. Lady Macbeth. She's pretty amar amazing. She comes on stage. She's, she's mad at him. So, uh, one of my students once said she wears the pants in the family. <clears throat> and, you know, you get a sense of that. Notice she walks in and she says, uh, where, where have you been? The king. He's almost up. He, you know, and Macbeth says, has he asked for me? No, no, you're in his house. Duh, right? No, you're not. He has. What's wrong with you? She's like this to him. His response is, I've talked myself out of this. We ain't going to do this. No, no we're not going to do this. No, this is what he says. We'll proceed no further in this. Look, what, look what he calls it, business. Uh, dude, it's called murder. In this business, we're not going to do it anymore, right? I'm on page 357, right? right roughly line 30, uh, 33 or so. He says, Macbeth says, he hath honored me of light. He, dude, he gave, me a, he gave me an award. And I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people. This would be a dumb thing to do, he says, because I'm all, I mean, everyone already thinks I'm a, I'm a really good guy. I have fame now from all sorts of people, which would be, uh-oh, I'm back to garment clothing theme again. Do you see it? Are you reading it with me? which would be worn now in their newest clothes. He says, Duncan's just given me a brand new suit of clothes. He's speaking in metaphor. Why, why would I take out those suit of clothes and go get other clothes? I'm, I'm gonna wear this suit for a while, I'm fine. Lady Macbeth, and this is why we go to watch the play and not just study the play. Lady Macbeth will sometimes take a step away, look him up and down, and then start stepping towards him as she says the next thing. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Back to the garment theme again. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale? What are you, chicken? At what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Whoa, what does she say to him? I thought you what? That's, that's her first argument. I thought you loved me. Here I was thinking all this time you loved me. And you, do, you don't love me. Oh. She keeps going though. That, that's not enough. The first step is to bring into doubt whether she, he actually loves her or not. But he, 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 she doesn't stop here. The woman is genius. She clearly has kind of knocked him with that one about... I thought you loved, oh, oh, I thought I was in love with the man who loved me back. <laughs> oh, that's, but she's not done. That's just step one. Look at the genius of Lady Macbeth. Step two, art thou, look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm working at line 39. Art thou afeard? Are you scared? To be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Are you afraid? You must. Oh, you don't love me because you're a chicken. <laughs> oh. Now, again, we go to the play to watch Macbeth's face as she says this. Because his face as she says this is the face of most guys when they get thrown down like this. Ugh. Makes them mad, but it works. Notice she keeps going. Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life and live a coward? She uses the word. In thine own esteem? She doesn't say, I'm calling you a coward. She's saying, you're going to call yourself a coward in your own esteem. Oh, she says, I'm so sad for you. Because someday you're going to say you're a total coward. 
because you're unwilling to do what you know you have to do. She says, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. You're just too afraid. There is as well, let's point it, put it in our notes. Not only does she call into question his fidelity and love, not only does she call into question whether he's um, uh, afraid or not, she seems with this cat in the adage line to also call into question his intelligence. You're probably just not smart enough to do it, huh? That's probably why you're not, that's probably why you're not, you're not going to pull this off, right? Notice Macbeth will use the M word, not Lady Macbeth. She's smart enough to lead him there. Then she stands back and lets him say it himself. Look at what he says. Privy, peace. Let's point out, it's pretty amazing how this is a play where you get to watch a man lose his peace of mind. Later in the, in the, in the play, in third act, Macbeth will use this word picture. Are you ready for this? He says, I feel like somebody cut off the top of my head, opened up my skull, put a bunch of scorpions on my brain, and then put the top of my skull back on and sewed it up so that the scorpions can't get out. What a powerful word picture. He says, my mind is filled with scorpions, stinging. No peace anymore. He will use the word peace here, and the moment he uses it, all of his peace will go away. He'll never have it back again from this point on. But look what he says next. I dare do all. I'm at the top of 358. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. I'm more than a, of a man than any other man. Well, now, wait a minute. We know that's true. We already heard it said in 1-2. When Duncan asked about the battle, and the soldier said, dude, I can't even begin to tell you what I just saw. There were like all these bad guys. And Macbeth stood in the middle of the battlefield and said, yeah, bring it on. I'm, I'm here. Let's dance. And he slaughtered all of them. We know what kind of fighter guy this guy is. We know what kind of man he is. And yet notice, this is convincing information for young men. Even a man who has proved himself, this argument works. Oh, oh, I thought you were a man. Oh, well, I guess I better go find myself a real man. You know, somebody that can really take care of it. There's the door. And there's... Get out. Fascinating. Why doesn't Macbeth say, there's the door? Why? Why does it work? Why does it work? Of course, we don't have to answer that question. It's rhetorical in nature, right? It's called, it's called girls are smarter than guys. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I told you we'd have a fight, Miss Keller. I told you. I didn't make it up. It's Shakespeare who made it up. Wait a minute. Lady Macbeth is using a tried and true approach in argument. Let's call it what it is. In persuasion, we call this rhetoric. R-H-E-T-O-R-I-C. Rhetoric. Okay? Rhetoric. Not so much what you say, but how you say it. This woman is genius. Oh. Notice, notice she doesn't, notice she doesn't, she doesn't get like really mad. Her voice is really calm. Oh. He goes, we're not going to do this thing. Oh, that's okay. I, I thought you loved me. And besides that, I thought you like, I thought you were like a real guy. I, 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 dude, if you're afraid to do this, you probably aren't smart enough to pull it off anyway. And he comes back and says, I'm a man. He takes the bait. I'm a man. Look at what she says. What? No, no, she doesn't say you're not a man. She doesn't say that. Look what she says. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? Why did you ever mention it? If you weren't going to do it, why did, you why did you mention it? If you knew you weren't going to do this, why'd you bring it up? She's the one that wanted to do it. Why'd you bring Ooh. See, here we go. See, here we go. We're back to this thing about intelligence. She's able, she's able to work him mentally. What beast was it that allowed you to bring it up? Keep going. When you durst do it, then you were a man. Oh, there's the argument. Oh, you want to be a man? That's simple. Do what you said you were going to do. Kill the old man, then you're a man. Then I got my man back. 
Again, Lang says, there's the door. That's not what he says. This works. Are you ready for this? Yes, ma'am. Right, this, this works because in the history of the world, this works. Dude, right now, guys and girls in this room, and here's the thing. This is, a, this is not just a gender-based argument, right? There are a number of girls who can say, somebody has convinced me in the same way. We have a, la a, la a line for this. We call it peer pressure, don't we? Notice what Shakespeare does, though. He shows you. He opens the, he opens the, the, the lid off of the, the, the chest. He shows you this is how peer pressure works. People who are really good at it know how to get inside your head, not by going directly at it, but by going around. You're not, he, Macbeth's not, he's stunned by all of this. You are a man when you do it. That means if you do it, you are a man. Keep going. She's not done yet. Oh, not done yet. Keep going. Nor time, nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. You have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. You were a man, and now you're nothing. That's low. That's, that's low. By the way, this unmake you, this unmake you, even has a double entente, a double meaning that is actually sexual in nature. It is almost as if she says, you used to have a set, and now you're like emasculated. It's like you don't have a set anymore. <laughs> that's this double, that's this unmake you line. And the groundlings, by the way, they, the groundlings of Shakespeare's day, they knew immediately what Lady Macbeth is doing here. This is genius. Lady Macbeth is working. She is taking Macbeth apart, right, psychologically. Taking him apart. Notice he hasn't said anything other than, I'm a man. I'm, a, I'm as much a man as anybody. That's all he said. And she just undresses his psyche. Keep going. She's not done yet. I given suck. Now, when you hear that line, you immediately think sexual, of course. And Shakespeare wants you to think sexual. The groundlings are like, yeah. But wait, that's, but that's not. But, but wait, that's not, that's not where she's going. This is Shakespeare playing head games now. Watch this. Hello? This is Shakespeare playing head games with his audience. I have given suck and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. Earlier in the play when she stepped to the front of the stage and unsex me here, that unsex me here line, lots of actresses will actually do one of these where they will say, because if you go back and look at the lines, it's deeply sexual. She will in fact invite the powers of evil to come and to nurse off of her breast. That's the language she uses, it's deeply sexual. Here she will say, I have nursed a baby by the way, later in the play, we're going to find out this isn't true. Macbeth has never had a child. He's never had a child. We're going to find that out later in the play. Lady Macbeth has never actually had a child. But here, it's right. She's saying, if I ever have a child, and now he's nursing it. Keep reading. I've given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face have plucked the nipple from its boneless gums and dashed the brains out. And of course, a really good actress, and that's why we go to watch these plays, like on Broadway, right? A really fine actress of Lady Macbeth will emphasize the word dashed when she says, dashed the brains out. It is a powerful word picture. And immediately we're reminded of the fact that Macbeth himself killed the bad guy by slitting him from the groin to the gullet and pulling out all of his entrails. Remember, that's what we're told. We're, we, we, you get this really violent image Right? She says, I would have dashed the little baby's brains out if had I sworn, notice the word sworn here, as you have done to this. Let's just point out something genius about Lady Macbeth. Macbeth never swore anything. He wrote a letter in which he said, the three witches said, I'm going to get to be king. Right? She comes on stage reading it at 1-5. Then when he comes on stage, she says, when is he going to go, the king? Oh, he's supposed to leave tomorrow. No. What's wrong with your face? Come on, we got to get this thing done. Come on. <laughs> Macbeth will ask the obvious question. What about if we fail? She comes back and says, we fail? As in, Psh, what? She says then, screw your courage to the sticking place. And again here, Shakespeare intentionally using sexual language with the word screw, no doubt. But... Her double picture is a vice. We're going to screw a vice down, and we're, we're going to be so courageous about this, we'll never get caught. And then the plan. 
Let's finish with the plan. The plan is this. We're going to get Duncan's bodyguards drunk. Then they're going to go to sleep. Then we're going to sneak in, we're going to stab the old guy, and then we're going to spread blood all over the bodyguards and make it look like it's theirs. They kill the guy. Done. What do you say? And Macbeth goes, great idea. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Which is kind of proof that just because you can stand on a battlefield and kill lots of guys doesn't necessarily mean you're the brightest crown in the box. You know what I'm saying? Lady Macbeth will tell Macbeth, this is our plan. And Macbeth's response is, I hope all of our men end up just like you. I hope all of our boys, all of the children that we have together and their sons, I hope they end up just like you. That reversal of gender role is intentional by Shakespeare. She is the masculine. He is the feminine. She has led him right down the road by the nose. And it has worked. It obviously begs a really intriguing question why it worked. One argument is she's smarter than him. Another argument is, no, no, this doesn't have as much to do with intelligence. This has to do with ego. Guys have Montana-sized egos, and they hate it when a beautiful woman calls into question their ability, any level, any kind of ability, and it works because Macbeth allows it to work. Of course, anybody watching this play can call Macbeth an idiot. But anybody who's doing any kind of annotation work at 3B has to turn around and ask the question at least one time in the last year, have you done something you didn't want to do because somebody used rhetorical arguments and led you there? And then you found yourself doing it only to say later, gosh, I was so unbelievably stupid. Why did I do this? Of course, when children get caught, what's the first question adults usually ask them? What were you thinking? Right? I don't know. Macbeth will answer. Right, that's the answer. I don't know. I don't, right? I don't know. One or two 18 year olds still report. I don't know. I, I, right? Macbeth will be the same way. Now, when we come back, not tomorrow because, of course, no school for you. When we come back on Monday, we will be into Act Two. The first question, and I want you to think about this over the weekend. The first question I'm going to ask you, though, is what is wrong with this plan? What is wrong with this plan to kill Duncan in your own house? What is wrong with this plan? And how do we get right away that this is probably not going to work out very well? And yet, are you ready for this, ironically? It does, it does work out. And yet when we look at it, it's like, dude, this is like the stupidest idea imaginable. You're going to get bodyguards who test Duncan's food every day. So if it's poison, they die instead of him. You're going to get bodyguards drunk. Then you're going to then you're going to kill the king because they're drunk. And then they're going to wake up the next morning with blood smeared all over them. And people are going to come and discover Duncan's dead. And they're going to go, well, what happened? Did you kill the king? Dude, I can't remember. Like last night we were like partying with Lady Macbeth. And it was like really cool and everything. And then I don't know. You were partying with who? That's what she says. I'm going to, I'm going to mess around with them and get them drunk. And then, they'll, and then you can kill them. Right? Of course, it begs the question, why, why would bodyguards kill the king and then decide to take a nap? Right? Yeah. It makes no sense, right? And of course, right, and then they're going to spread blood all over themselves. Right? Of course, it also begs the question, what would bodyguards hope to gain by killing the king? They're bodyguards. It's not like they're going to get to become king or something. There's nothing to be gained by this, and yet Macbeth will hear Lady Macbeth's plan and go, great idea. That's what we'll do. Love it. Love it. Oh, well, guys, maybe they are smarter than us.